כן. אוקיי, let's, uh, let's just pray. Yeah, let's look to the Lord and um, let's just come before him. You know, many of us uh, at the beginning of the day, we, are, we could be happy, positive, but some of us could be down, maybe physically, emotionally, but whatever it is, let us draw, draw near to God because he's the answer. He's our strength. He's our source of hope. He's our comfort. So let's draw near to him. Uh, the Bible says that when we draw near to God, we can draw near to him, um, fully believing that he is who he said he is. And the Lord is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So, you know, as we, as we pray this morning, we are going to diligently seek, which means sincerely, with all effort, with everything within us, to seek the Lord. And say, God, whatever you have in store for us today, in, for, in store for me today, Lord, we, we are expectant, we are ready to receive. And so, God, we come before you. Yes, Father God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the promise, Lord, of your presence. Lord, we thank you for the promise in your word that you are a rewarder of those who diligently seek you. And what great reward, Lord, can we hope for and can we ask for? Lord, than your presence, O oh God, as your word declares, for you your, yourself, Lord, are our greatest reward, Master. Father, we thank you, Lord. And I just pray right now for every need, Lord, that could be there in every person. Lord, some that have been spoken, some that they are contending for, a breakthrough. And some of those needs, Lord, unspoken, but Lord, so private and personal. And so, God, we pray, the God who knows all, the God who sees all, Lord, the God is ever present, Master, that you would, Lord, meet those needs, Lord. And Lord, as we draw near this morning, we also draw near, Lord, with our praise, Lord, sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, Father God. We thank you for all that you are to us. We thank you, Lord, for the life that we have. We thank you, Father God, for the blessings that we enjoy, Master. Yes, Lord, if we were to write down, Lord, all the blessing one after another, Lord, Yes, Lord, there would not be room enough, Lord, to contain all the ways that you have blessed us, Father. God, so we thank you. We thank you for blessing us. We thank you immeasurably, Lord, in a rich manner, Lord, we thank you for blessing us. And Lord, we thank you that you continue to load our lives, as your word says, that you load us, load daily, Lord, with benefits, oh, Father God. And you take pleasure in the prosperity of your servant. We thank you, Father God. We thank you. We, we commit ourselves, Lord, into your mighty hands as we begin this day, Lord, and all the sessions throughout this day, Lord. We pray that you would speak to us. In Jesus' matchless name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so last class, we, we looked at uh, <clears throat> um, ministering to the Lord, how we are called to be worshippers and becoming worshippers, right? So we, we saw the, uh, you know, we looked at that example of that woman with the alabaster jar of, uh, uh, of a very precious thing that she offered unto God. And we also looked at the presence of God. Okay, so we looked at the varying degrees of the presence of God. Okay, and that is what makes the difference in, in worship. Okay? Because when we draw near to him, he has promised to draw near to us. And when we begin to praise him, you know, we are more aware of the presence of God because he reigns in the praises of his people. So we become more aware of the presence of God, uh, uh, maybe personally or corporately. So uh, we begin to experience the presence of God. And in the presence of God, some amazing things happen. Right? In the presence of God, evil is vanquished. There is victory. In the presence of God, darkness flees. Or in the tangible presence of God, manifest presence of God, we see that you know there is there are like the word word of God says that there is there are blessings forevermore, right? So in the presence of God, all these wonderful things happen, and we are privileged to enjoy to experience the presence of God, right? The fellowship with God, the experience you know of the presence of God, the tangible presence of God, we are indeed blessed to enjoy that, right? So so we just look at uh, some of those aspects of the presence of God before we move on to personal and corporate worship, right? So in the presence of God, we bring, we bring something, right? We bring something to God. We bring the sacrifice of 
praise and worship to God. Right? It's something that we need to stir ourselves up and bring before Him. Right? And, and say, God, you know, this is something that I bring. And we know that it's a response to God revealing Himself to us. Right? And Hebrews 13, if you want to turn there, Hebrews 13. <clears throat> And um, this is verse 15, right? Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. So God sees your praise and you know our praise, not just as mere words, but he sees it as a sacrifice, a sacrifice of thanksgiving, an offering of thanksgiving, an offering of praise. So he sees it as an offering. Right, a sacrifice. So just like how the Old Testament times, the, the, the priest would do it, take the sacrifice and go before him. Uh, the same way he sees it. So, you know, so we are privileged to bring the sacrifice of praise to God. Okay. So when we bring the sacrifice, what happens? What does God do? We are coming and offering, saying, God, you know, this is we are ministering unto him, and we're saying, God, we're bringing this sacrifice of praise. These are words and songs and, and you know the outpouring of our hearts. What, what happens? God is pleased. What does God do? So when you offer something, what do you do? You, you take, you receive, right? In the book of Judges, we see this. And Gideon has this encounter, right, with the angel of the Lord. He, he says, you know, I'm going to prepare a, prepare this meal. He places it on the rock. What happens is fire comes out of the rock and consumes the sacrifice. Okay, that's what we see in the book of Judges. So God receives, takes, consumes what you're offering. Right? He receives it. It's not like he's, he's turning a deaf ear. No, he receives it. And when he receives it, when he when he takes it, that's when we experience the, the presence of God. Okay? So there is an interaction. So praise and you know praise and worship. It's not just one way of us just bringing something. God is receiving. He's pleased. He's receiving. And when he receives, there is an exchange. Right? There is an interaction that happens. And in that inter interaction, we experience the presence and the power of God. And that's why you know we. You know, sense in our spirit man, first of all, and also in our physical senses, the presence of God. Okay, so we use that word, you know, over and over again the presence of God. The presence of God was, you know, was different this time. The presence of God was mighty. The presence of God, uh, you know, uh, was so heavy, and all these things, right, that we use. Right? So if you got, uh, I think I, I uploaded that book. Uh, in the classroom section, it is there for online students. Um, but I, I just want to encourage you to, you know, get a hold of that copy, physical copy, right? Uh, the presence of God, and read through it, right? Because many times we use the word presence of God, but we don't have a like a strong understanding of it. What is this presence of God? Right? It is something like a smoke. Is it something like, uh, you know, is it a feeling? What is it? So this, you know, this study, this Bible, the study, this book, uh, Presence of God, actually gives an in-depth study of what it, what is it, what do, what do we mean by the presence of God, and what we should, uh, what should our heart posture be when it comes to the presence of God. Okay, so in the Old Testament, the presence of God literally means the face of God. Right. So when you say I, I want to seek the presence of God, you're saying no, I want to I want to have an encounter with Him. I want to see. I want to seek the face of God. To to be in the presence of God is to gaze upon the face of God. And we know that we do it in a spiritual sense, right? In our hearts, right? we gaze upon the presence of God. We gaze upon the face of God. So it it, it literally means the face of the Lord. And we see people in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, and we, when we looked at it, we saw that people experienced God in powerful ways, but they still 
went after the presence of God. Like we, 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 you know, we were looking at the life of Moses. Moses experienced a lot of things right from the time he was called, you know, from the burning bush. God, he had an encounter, and God took him and used him in a mighty way in the land of Egypt to to deliver the people out of Egypt. And he saw those wonderful things. And even in the wilderness, you know, the Lord would meet with him, speak to him in the tabernacle, the cloud would descend and he would, you know, he would step into the tabernacle and God would descend and he would speak. And after all that, what was Moses' cry? What did he tell the Lord? Lord, show me your glory. And he said, Lord, if you are not going to be with us, if your presence does not go with us, we don't want anything. You know, we don't want to get into that. You know, we don't want to go further. Right? So he was hungry for the presence of God because he valued the presence of God. Right? And then the psalmist also says the same thing. He says, you know, cast me not away from your presence, O Lord. Right? And in the New Testament, we see all the apostles. And then specifically when we read about Paul, he says, you know, uh, that I may know you and the power of your on the power of your resurrection. Right? He was seeking after God. Right? So, so also for us, and I know it's a repetition, that we need to become hungry for more of God. We need to become hungry for more of God. There are many things that can take away that hunger. right? If it's a, long, a, a wrong focus, if it is uh, you know, something that we are uh, you know, willfully sinning, or... You know, many other things can take away the pla you know the place of us drawing near to God or that hunger for God. Right? I don't know if you've heard this phrase. You know, the good becomes the enemy of the best. Have you heard that? The good is the enemy of the best. Sometimes we are satisfied with the good, but God wants the best. We are satisfied. We're saying, okay, God, this is okay. This is fine. Where I am is okay. Like, I... I'm satisfied. I don't want to go any further. So that becomes our limiting point. That becomes our barrier. That becomes, you know, our ceiling. Right? So right, right now, in all of our lives, there is a ceiling. Meaning, we're not able to go beyond that. Right? That becomes a limiting point. The good becomes the enemy of the, of the best. But the fact is that God can take us further. Right? Because, simply because... He is infinite, simply because there is more to him. You know, we, we, sometimes we come to a place in our lives and we say, oh, I think I've, I've understood God. I think I understand a lot of things in the word, a lot of things in the Bible. I think I'm, you know, I've reached. Then God surprises us and says, hey, here are 10 things. Here are 20 things that you don't know. There are, there are so many things that you, know, you need to understand about me. God surprises us and says, okay, you need to go even further. So, whatever you know, it's phase of life we are in, season of life. You know, there seems to be a ceiling, but we need to go beyond that ceiling. And one main way to do that is to hunger for the presence of God. Say, God, I'm not satisfied. I want more, God. To go and to really delight in the presence of God. Delight in the presence of God. You know, when we look at the Psalms, um, let's look at Psalm one. Psalm chapter 1. Okay. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Okay. Talks about behavior. Talks about external behavior and choice. Right. What is this person? You know, he's... He's not walking in the counsel, advice of the ungodly. He's not standing in the path of sinners, meaning, you know, he's not making those choices with the sinners will make the path, right? And, and not as he sit in the seat of the scornful, you know, he's not in the place of uh, the, the authority of the scornful, the one, ones who make fun of, the ones who, you know, ridicule maybe good things and uh, high values and so on. So he's not doing any of that choices, behavior. Look at verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. This is Old Testament, right? Old Testament, seasonal visitation of the Holy Spirit on some people, no indwelling presence, no release of gifts, 
to dwell and you know with the believer this is old testament and he's and it's talking about a person whose delight is in the law of the lord right the scriptures right so when we delight ourselves in him right? what is delight huh great pleasure enjoyment excited so delight is to truly engage to truly enjoy right see we can either endure or enjoy right you can say okay oh god i need to read i need to pray i need to, we can endure it and say okay this is what is expected of me you know as a believer i need to do this if i don't do this you know maybe bad things will happen wrong things will happen you know that's that's endurance but here it talks about one who's delighting right one who's delighting in the law of the lord and it says that he meditates day and night right it's not, it's uh, nobody's uh, you know nobody's forcing that person but he is naturally drawn to the law of the lord he is seen the beauty of the law of the lord and so he meditates what does meditate mean anyone sorry sir focus any other words ah huh? sorry ponder okay ponder what does ponder mean yeah so you think you think deeply you think over and over again ponder focus right so yeah somebody said something sorry discipline okay you need certain discipline to meditate but to meditate is to to think deeply to think over and over again to make sure that you have the mind space right that you know the words of god the idea of god the thoughts of god is there you know you're giving it space you're not distracted you're not shutting it away you're not rejecting it from your mind right you're thinking about it you're giving space in your mind for it so that's meditation right to think continuously yes um so so these are some things that you're doing and so it says here he meditates day and night you know who would meditate day and night one who's got this as a lifestyle you know one who's thinking delighting about god singing maybe you know the truths of god's word is doing it it's become second nature right it's become second nature you're doing it even as you're you know walking you know maybe you might cooking you're you know doing other stuff you know gardening whatever you know from your heart you're actually thinking deeply oh this is what i read this morning this is what i heard about god this morning god you know i, I when i look at this uh, you know when i face these challenges when i face these difficulties or this problem you know uh, god i i'm just reminded that uh, this is who this is who you are if you were here physically this is what you would do right so you're thinking you're making those connections you're meditating right and of course for the for the jewish uh, in the jewish time in the in the you know in the times of the old testament and for the jews it meant something it meant that they were muttering speaking the truth okay they would say oh blessed is he who walks not they would just mutter those scriptures speak those scriptures softly and all the while they will be like rocking back and forth and they, it was just an exercise for them to do it you know exercise in meditation they would speak it out they would think deeply they would make sure that the word of god and the idea of god the thoughts of god remain in their thinking in their minds so here it's talking about someone who was meditating someone whose delight is in the lord then comes the promise he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in season so there is a condition right lord is saying hey this is this is bound to happen but if you delight if you meditate right? if you allow my thoughts to go through your thoughts to replace some of those empty futile thoughts if you do that then that's that's going to change things you know you're going to be successful even though things around might be difficult you know you are you are going to be fresh you are going to be flourishing you are going to be you know you're going to be rejoicing you're going to be giving answers you're going to be you know providing those 
the solutions and for difficulties and all that. So that's what Lord says. So why are we looking at that? You know, this is about pursuing the presence of God, like going deeper, going further, right? Not satisfied with status quo, not satisfied with where we are, saying, God, I just want more. I want more. You know, so for all of us, you know, as, as Bible college students and you know, as, as believers, there is more. Right? There is more. There is more beyond the ordinary routine of life. There is more beyond you know, uh, uh, whatever career, business, and etc. You know, all well, all that has its place. You could be doing, you know, you could be working as a doctor. You could be, you know, running a school. You could be running an orphanage. You could be, you know, a pastor. Whatever it is, there is more. Right, and and that is in seeking, being hungry for the presence of God. Right, the Word of God, the presence of God, the things of the Spirit to be hungry. So to make sure. That whatever it is that hinders with your appetite. What is appetite? Do you all have a good appetite? Yeah? You get up in the morning, you want to have a solid breakfast, yeah, and then lunch, go for it, right? Belt it. So you have a good appetite. You're hungry, which means your body is healthy. And you have a good appetite, it means, yeah. Your body is functioning well. You're working, working out. You're, you know, um, you're shedding calories. You're expending, and your, you know, your body requires. What happens when you have a temperature? When you have a fever? Do you feel like eating biryani? You feel like, oh no, today I don't feel like it. Right? Or maybe you, you got a you know, food poisoning, upset stomach, etc. You bring the best of food. You know, you feel like, no, just give me some, some curds. I'll be satisfied. Your appetite is gone. Why? Because something is not right. And something is not right. Right? Or maybe we ate on some junk food or something and then we're not able to eat a proper meal. No, like when we were growing up, our dinner time was at 8:30. 8:30 p.m. Dinner. Everybody gets together. You know, my me, my brother, and we we were given responsibility to heat the food and keep it on the table. And my parents will come back from work, from clinic and all that. And then we have to sit down and eat 8.30, no matter what. But between 7 to 8.30, like, we'll be playing. And there is this ground where we will normally play. And there is this amazing Chinese food, right? They bring it in their cart. And they'll be cooking. And then you can smell, you can smell the soup. You can smell the starters and everything, and we won't have much money, but then we'll be like drawn to that. So we'll go. Sometimes, you know, suppose we have some, you know, pool in some money and then, you know, buy some one soup, one by two, right? Or sometimes one by three, <laughs> okay? Have it with friends and then get something else. And if we have, if, we have, if you are feeling rich, oh, wow, let's today we'll have fried rice and then, you know, we share it and two or three of us have one fried rice. But the thing is, 8.30, we know it's dinner time, right? But dinner time, even if there's the best of food, we are pushing the food on the plate. We're not hungry. Something else has replaced that. Something else has spoiled that hunger. So my, my mother will always have the doubt. Now, did you guys eat anything before this? Right? Because we were not supposed to eat those street foods, right? Did you eat anything? It'll be like, we won't be able to answer yes. We won't be able to answer, give a proper answer. Now we'll be evading the answer. Like sometimes God asks, you know, what happened? Where's your hunger? And we're like, um, I don't know, God. I don't know. Maybe uh, today I don't feel like it. Mood nahi hai. There's no mood. And why is there no mood? Because we've lost our focus. You know, there's something has killed the appetite. Something has uh, messed with our appetite. Right? And so... It's our responsibility to really protect that. Because this presence of God and time in His presence is something precious. Right? Something precious. So we need to protect that. I remember reading a testimony about uh, this man called Todd White. And he was, you know, he was a messed up man. In a sense, right from a young age, you know, coming from a tough background, 
uh, I think his parents were into drugs, whatever. So he got into drugs. He got into selling drugs, uh, alcohol. You know, it was part of his life for a long time. Right? Uh, he he had a daughter. He was not married, but then he and his girlfriend had a daughter, and could not give you know this daughter a good life, and and he was his life was going on like that. Then he met the Lord. He saw the difference. He saw the difference in the beauty of the Lord. He saw the holiness. He experienced holiness and the presence of God for the first time in his life. And he was just blown away. Right? He was a drug addict, but he got you know, uh, delivered from drugs without any cold turkey or without any of those you know, side effects and all that. He just got delivered. So he knew this is something amazing. This presence of God, this sense of righteousness is given me this purity and holiness and all that is given me something precious. So he says that, you know, he, he, he was in this place called Teen Challenge and, uh, you know, like a rehab center. And, and, and then they would take, you know, they would take that van and then on a Sunday morning they would drive to the church and all these guys will be there in the rehab and in the and they'll be going down the road and you know they'll be seeing some ladies and then all the other guys will be whistling and you know you know talking you know shouting some lewd things and at the ladies but you know he would just he would just say god i cannot do that and like how can i do that and, and protect himself he say what you've given me is so precious i'm going to defend that i'm going to protect that right so you know, maybe, you know, if somebody comes to hit you, you'll defend yourself, right? Yes or no? You'll defend yourself. Somebody comes with a knife. Somebody comes, you know, with a gun and says, or, you know, with, uh, with your family. and You'll defend yourself, right? So what are you defending right now? Ask yourself, am I defending this sense of the presence of God, this righteousness, this testimony that he's given me, am I defending that? Right. Am I protecting that? Am I defending that? Right. It's an it's a, it's a important thing for us to consider. It's an important question for us to ask. Because we can't just go through life and, and just think that oh, nothing will happen. There's no attack. There's no nothing. You know, I don't have to defend. I just have to be like that. Live my life. No. What are you protecting right now about yourself? What are you defending about your, about yourself, about your life? Right? Are you considering the 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 beauty and the preciousness of the presence of God, righteousness and testimony and all that, the fellowship that you have with Him? Is it worth defending? So that's the thing. Is it worth defending, yes or no? We, we won't be able to answer with a resounding yes unless we know the value of value of it. And these, and these people whom we see in the Bible knew the value of it. And they say, hey, if your presence is not there, I'm not going. I'm not going further. I don't want this life. Right? You know, I, I used to live a, a life that was compromising a life that was a double life, right? As a believer, a double life. After coming to know Jesus, a double life. And uh, this was years before. Don't think it was yesterday. It was years before. Before I came into ministry and all that. So, you live a double life. Monday to Saturday, spirit. <laughs> Sunday, spirit. <laughs> okay? Double life. Or Monday to Friday. Saturday, Sunday, I'd be back home. So I was traveling on work, you know, checking into hotels, right? Doing all kinds of stuff on the TV and, you know, internet, whatever. And having, you know, uh, this kind of life. Come back and... So then, I reached a point when I was just disgusted. I said, God, I can't do this anymore. Can't do this. Putting on this two-face... Suddenly, you know, you don't you don't remember what mask you should put. You no, know, you get messed up. Oh, maybe I put a wrong mask. Then, that's when 
I realized that, hey, if I'm continuing like this, I'm not going to hear the voice of God clearly in my life. The voice of God is going to just diminish. He's not going to force things, right? The voice of God in my life has been saying, showing things, scripture, you know, all these wonderful things that he's leading, revelation. Hey, that's going to go dimmer and dimmer because I'm going to go insensitive to that. Hebrews 3 talks about that. Like you said, let your heart not become hardened because of the deceitfulness of sin. So your conscience is, is just seared and and then I realized, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to lose this. If I lose this hearing, this voice of God, experiencing the presence of God, I've lost everything in life. Everything in life, right? The presence of God, the voice of God. What, what, what else? You know, for a believer, if you don't have that, you don't have anything. Right? Then that's when I realized, hey, I need to get back. I need to get back to God. I can't afford to lose this, this one thing, right? The voice of God, the presence of God in my life. I can't just afford to lose it. Right? The fact was that God was const constantly, you know, drawing me to him. So that's when, you know, I said, okay, God, you know, this is worth defending. This is worth fighting for, right? This is worth giving it all you've got and saying, I'm going to defend this. I'm going to protect this. I'm going to make sure that, uh, the attack of the enemy, you know, attack of the enemy, yes, we are more aware, but there are these subtle things, you know, our own flesh, our own flesh, appetites of our own flesh, our own desires. You know, we need to be careful. Like somebody says, I'm my own enemy. Right? We need to be careful about our own things, our own unrenewed thinking, our own, you know, unrenewed flesh, and say, God, this is worth defending. So that's why Paul says, you know, we, we looked at that verse. Uh, Paul says, you know, I consider everything as refuse or dung compared to the excellence of the knowledge of Christ. You know, we saw that in Colossians, right? Um, yeah, was it in Colossians or Philippians? Yeah, I think it was Philippians, right? Philippians 3, right? Philippians, he talks about his lineage, he talks about his educational background, his training as a Pharisee and all that, and his righteousness according to the law, which was impeccable. <coughs> and then he says, you know, what things were gained for me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Give me just one second. Okay. These are, I've counted loss for Christ. And then verse 8, and indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. That's his perspective. He's saying, you know, I've counted them as loss. And the word he used as rubbish is like excreta, you know, refuse, dung. Saying, you know, I count that because the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus is nothing compared to that. Right? It's nothing compared to that. Right? So, so I just want to, you know, kind of, um, uh, in, you know, kind of encourage us and also to warn us, encourage us and also to warn us that, that we don't take the presence of God lightly. We don't take the presence of God. Lightly, the indwelling presence of God, the manifest presence of God, you know, his voice that we hear, his, his leading to the scriptures, we, that we don't take it lightly. It's worth defending all the attack that comes against it. It's worth being on fire for, right? Not only now, but for the rest of our lives, right? So when we talk about the presence of God, I just want to, um, you know, if you've got this book, you can follow through in that. Uh, let me just project that for the students.
Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. So let's look at um, you know the presence of God, and uh, I'm just looking at um, this chapter called In His Presence, which is chapter two. Okay. In His Presence. So in person class, do you have the publications? Do you have the book? No? In his presence. Um, yeah. yeah it, it is actually I can see it, it's there, but um, maybe we can uh, share one one per table for now. Is there in that fourth shelf, left corner? Uh, fourth shelf, fourth uh, down. Yeah, left corner. I think left corner, yeah. Um, maybe each per each table can have one, and then um, and then we'll see. Okay. Okay. So, um, in the presence of God, what happens? Right? What happens in the presence of God when we pursue the presence of God? Right? What is it that happens? And I think we need to do that. We need to we need to know that, understand that, so that we know the value of the presence of God. First of all, I just want to say that you know, just to know Him, just to know Jesus, just to know Him as a person is something so so valuable, right? Have you met anyone like Jesus? <laughs> just think about Jesus. You know, people wanted to be with Him. Right? They just wanted to be with them. Sinners, people who are doing the wrong things, they just wanted to hang out with them, be with them, just to be in his presence. You know, I'm sure that you know some there are some people in our lives where we just want to be with them. Right? It could be some friend, it could be someone, you know, someone who um, who you know they may not sorry. They may not be, you know, saying stuff. You know, they might not be doing anything. They might not be, but we just want to be with them, for whatever reason. You know, we just want to be with them. Maybe they are good listeners. Maybe they encourage us. Maybe they say something. You know, they may, they, maybe we just have some great conversations with them, right? And uh, suddenly, our heart is so full, just by having that fellowship and having that conversation with them, right? There are some people in our life. Just imagine Jesus, you know, ten times more, hundred times more, right? To be in his presence. So that is whom we are talking about. We're not talking about something that is uh, inanimate, but we are going to look at some of those things, right? So we're not looking at something like a power, something like yes, all that is there contained in him, but just want to you know focus on him as a person. Right? He's an amazing person to be with. And all of us, as believers, we have this awesome, awesome privilege to be in His presence every day, every day of our lives, every moment of every day, right? Yeah, big amen to that, <laughs> right? Because there's no one like Him. There's no one like Him. In the heavens, on the earth, there's no one like Him. So we have, as believers, we have this awesome, amazing privilege to be in his presence, to talk to him, just to spend time with him. So that is worth defending. Our time with him, quiet time, that's worth defending. That's worth prioritizing. That's worth giving it its importance. Right? And then when we talk about what happens to us in his presence, you know, that also gives us all the more, you know, all the more um, motivation and inspiration to do it. Okay. Let's look at you know, a few things here. First thing is that we are changed. <coughs> How many of us, you know, get up and say, "I wish I was some, like someone else." You know, I wish I could be like this. I wish I could be different. I wish I was stronger. I wish I was better looking. I wish I was, you know, uh, better qualities, better abilities. I wish. I wish. I wish. Right? In the presence of God, we are changed for the better. And that's what the Bible says, you know, Second uh, Corinthians 3 and verse 18, okay? Second Corinthians 3 and verse 18, it says, But we all with unveiled face, 
beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Okay. So what is that word used there? Saying we are being transformed, like metamorpho, which means in Greek, which means a drastic change. We are being transformed. So it doesn't mean that one day it happens, but we are being transformed. It's present continuous, right? It happens to us. How? Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. We are beholding the glory of God, who God is, what he does. You know, we are focusing, we are looking, we are making sure nothing hides us from that. Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. We are being transformed into that same image, you know, whom we are saying, oh, well, that is awesome. Jesus, you're awesome. You're, you're wonderful. We are being changed into that same image. You know, how else can we explain the life of the early church disciples, right? Even when they were being taken to be thrown to the lions, to be executed, they would pray for the soldiers who were actually taking them. You know, that's, that's history, a historical fact, in fact. You know, the, the historians record that this is what the early church believers did as they were being taken, as they were being dragged to be executed, they would pray for the people who are actually taking them, the soldiers who were taking them. Right. So such was their transformation because the Lord Jesus, from the cross, said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So they, beholding the glory of God, being transformed into that very same image. Like they're beginning to talk like him, beginning to walk like him. Right? Uh, the, um, Peter and John and the temple, you know, they were so bold, courageous, and talking to all those, you know, the, the, the temple leaders, the Sanhedrin and all the priests and high priests. And so one conclusion they came to, they looked at them, they saw that, hey, these guys are untrained guys. They are not trained in the scripture. They have not gone to the school of the Pharisees, but... Look at the way they are talking about God as if you know it's some personal experience. They say they looked at them and then they said they realized that they had been with Jesus. So being with Jesus, being in the presence of Jesus is transformative. Right? It's not automatic. We need to allow, we need to cooperate, but it's transformative nevertheless. And some of that change we don't even realize. It's happening. And some of our desires are changing, some of our longings are changing, some of those appetites are changing. Why? Because we are spending time beholding the glory of the Lord. Right? So we are being changed into that same image. So it's not the image of some noble person, of some guru or some teacher or whatever. You know, we are being transformed into the image of the Lord Himself. And that happens. So, you know, this when we have opportunities to gather, to worship, to, you know, we don't take it lightly. You know? We do it sincerely, intently, because there's something happening. There's change happening, right? So that's, that's, for, that's one thing that we see, that we are changed. You know, there is conviction in our hearts. Um, um, if, you, if you look at, uh, let's look at Psalm 51, right? Psalm 51, verse 9 to 12. It says, do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Right? Who says these words? David, after what does he say these words? After sinning with Bathsheba, sending the husband, getting the husband killed and... He has this encounter with the prophet, right, prophet Nathan. And then he realizes the greatness of his sin. Right? He's convicted with that word, with that prophetic word. He's convicted to God. Nothing escapes God's attention. He knows all. He sees all. And he, he has somehow reached out what he thought no one knew. God knew and he has reached out to him, right? So he, when he realized that, that is when you know, he says these words, or the words are recorded, and he says, don't cast me away from your presence, God. There's great conviction 
there's great conviction that happens you know maybe you know sometimes we think um, you know i need to i need to argue with this person i need to reason with this person and i need to convict that person you know I need to tell that person that person is wrong you know you're terribly wrong you're going off well we might actually argue win the argument at the end of it all lose the person right doesn't mean that we should not you know present facts present truth but i'm saying you no know, that could happen but when the lord convicts right there is deep conviction deep conviction right? so conviction happens in the presence of god right there is also brokenness right? there is brokenness along with conviction that a person comes to a place and saying god you know i'm i'm nothing i'm nothing right do you recall any person who encountered god and he said oh i am nothing anyone yeah yeah want to say something sorry oh sorry did you raise your hand you did okay so anyone who encountered god and said oh i am nothing uh in my personal prayer uh, -huh. uh one day i am fasting Uh, oh your personal experience yes. okay now i'm talking about in the bible the bible okay uh, yeah go ahead share your personal experience yeah in my personal prayer one day uh, i feel like alone and crying with god uh, everyone feel like me uh, imitating me and playing me i'm nothing why you bring me me and crying and crying and that day god i feel the like god presence and i encounter with jesus mm. uh, god spoke to me directly i am seeing you don't worry Mm. Uh, god spoke to me at that time okay so it was a reassuring time for you in the presence of god okay so when we um, yeah thank you so when we look at um, when we look at some of these things that uh, some of these encounters in the bible like uh, like um, like when i shared about um i think pooja has raised a hand pooja you want to say something okay so when we look at you know isaiah chapter 6 right isaiah has this awesome encounter all the temple the robe of god and this majestic vision of the seraphim you know and all the shouting out holy right and then what does he say alas i am undone so that happens you know that brokenness the fact that who oh, i'm in the presence of this awesome mighty holy pure god and we look at ourselves and we're like wow i'm nothing and brokenness happens in the presence of god okay we'll take a break and then we'll come back <laughs>